Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. You may have noticed something different if you're watching video on YouTube or on iTunes. If you're listening in your car, you should just notice the incredibly crisp and clear audio quality. If you're watching at home though, you'll notice that I'm on the beginnings of the new set for Bulletproof Radio here at Bulletproof Labs on Vancouver Island. And I have my first ever live guest, and his name is Max Lugavere. Max, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm really stoked because we've spent the whole day here recording with Vice Munchies, and I put you through the ringer on <laughs> the biohacking sort of thing. You did, and it was awesome. I really enjoyed it. But that's not why Max is on the show today. Max is on the show today because... Well, he's making a documentary that's really cool that's about a subject that's near and dear to me. So we're going to talk about that. But first, you've already missed your cool fact of the day, haven't you? So let's do our cool fact of the day, and then we're going to talk about his new documentary. Today's cool fact of the day is about why your phone number is seven digits. Because if you go back to oh, the 1950s, the guys at Bell Labs were looking at what would work best, and they figured out that we could remember on average seven things. And this is still that way for working memory today, unless you're doing something funky to train your working memory, or you just have an unusually good working memory. Um, what they found, though, was that if you put a three-chunk item before a four-chunk item, you could remember it better. So they actually did quantitative tests to see which ones worked best. So who knew that all of that science went into your phone number, and then we had area codes that screwed all that up, and then country codes, and then does, do you even know your phone number anymore? It's all built into these little things. You outsource that part of your brain anyway. Who needs working memory or attention span? It's true. Outsourced cognition, you know? Exactly. Thanks, Apple. Now, the reason that we are recording this podcast today is that You've made, or I'd say you're in the process of making a documentary on Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a film called Breadhead. Um, and we, basically my goal for the film is to be the first ever, you know, millennial focused documentary about the disruptive idea that is dementia prevention. Um, and this is a really important topic to me. I think it's actually the most important topic uh, because... You know, our brains really are who we are. They manufacture our minds, you know, and all of your incredible work, you know, in, in the realm of optimizing cognition and stuff like that is nothing if there's disease, you know, at play. And so I became obsessed with this topic when three years ago, my mom started showing signs of cognitive decline. And I've always, few people know this about me, but I was a, a programmer in high school. So I, in high school, attacked my own biology with the same sort of engineer's framework that, that you have, you know, in terms of biohacking and, and whatnot. Uh, but for me, it was like, I've never been overweight. I've never really had to deal with things like arthritis that, that I know that, you know, you have faced and overcome. But uh, it was really all about performance for me early on. Three years ago, uh, shit became real for me when my mom started showing these symptoms. And how old your mom? She was 59 when okay. it all started. So um, I used my penchant for understanding the science and research to really dig, in, dig into the science to figure out why women at 59 would start showing these symptoms. You know, on the one hand, to try to help her if that was even possible. Um, but on the other hand, to prevent this sort of stuff from ever happening to me. I mean, you know, like I'm a really creative person. I use my, my mind. My mind is my currency in life, you know? And so the idea that, that one day I could succumb to this like random, the randomness that is cognitive decline, to me was just uh, a horrific fate. And so what I learned at the time is that there are a bunch of myths that many people have about neurodegenerative disease. For one, that it's a disease of the old. Really what they found is that changes begin in the brain decades before the first symptom. Before that first like trip to the neurologist's office where you feel like something is awry with your cognition, that's like a 30-year disease process that's already yeah. set into motion. And so I just became obsessed with like living and eating in a way that optimizes my brain health. Because the idea of, of dementia and cognitive decline to me is like unfathomable. 
When I was in my mid 20s, I had cognitive decline. It was noticeable. I measured it in my performance on just a simple working memory task every day. That was called free cell as a form of solitaire. But some days I'm like, I can't remember what I'm doing here. Like it was very noticeable yeah. that whether I could perform or not perform, that was my quantitative measure. And I realized my daily performance was getting not so good. And, and I really dug in as well. In my case, it's because I felt it. In your case, it's because you saw it and it made you feel that you were vulnerable to it. But both of us are outliers. Most people in their mid 20s are already experiencing some degree of cognitive decline, usually from drinking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but you, already things aren't quite as good as they might have been when you were 22. And it's a, just a slow con- decline until all of a sudden you notice it and you start dropping words and it comes and it goes, but it's so subtle that you don't get it. Mm. And you're looking at Alzheimer's now. I went and I started working with the Silicon Valley Health Institute, working with people two and three times my age because they were focusing on the same thing, but they're trying to reverse damage. And I'm like, I already probably have some of this damage, but I don't want to undo it. And it turns out those same techniques increase performance, which is kind of an interesting thing that no one tells us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you can. Like, you know, when a researcher out of UCLA, Del Bredesen, comes out with a study where he, you know, showed a, an essential, essentially a reversal in symptoms you know, with patients, you know, that were dealing with things like mild cognitive impairment, early Alzheimer's disease, you know, and he put them on a diet that was, you know, low in in carbohydrates. He supplemented their diets with, with, you know, in this case, coconut oil or Axona. I don't know. I I don't recall specifically which one it was. Um, But, uh, you know, optimized their sleep with melatonin, you know, was making sure that they were exercising all the time. He, He published a study where he saw a reversal of cognitive decline. So, I mean, the, f- the idea that your cognitive health really is in your hands to me is an empowering idea. And it's not, it's not a notion that I was privy to before going through all this with my mom. I experienced going around the country and, and visiting various neurology departments with my mom, what is often described as diagnose and adios. And that to me was just awful, you know? And so uh, the idea that there are people out there that are spreading this empowering research, you know, the, the virtues of MCT oil, you know, of, you know, things like brain octane, you know, like, uh, to me, it's just like, people need to know about this stuff. It, it's pretty important in order to have a brain that works right now. And I don't think it really matters what age you get started, but just getting stable energy so you can have multiple sources of energy has changed my brain for the better. Uh, but you, you did something interesting with your Kickstarter campaign for Breadhead. You doubled your fundraising goal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who knew people care about their brain health, you know? Yeah. So we did a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it wrapped about two months ago. Um, you know, you definitely helped us get the word out. Yeah, so thank it, you. For that. It's a worthy cause. And, uh, yeah, I mean, people really took to it. It was one of those like magical viral things that, um, that, you know, we, our goal was $75,000 because we figured that was enough to really, you know, give the project the sort of jolt that it needed to bring it to life. And we ended up raising, Double and it was tweeted by you know Dave Asprey. He was you know, some guy. <laughs> it's tweeted by Jared Leto, Maria Shriver, like all kinds of celebrities. You know, people really um, people were incredibly supportive, and it was awesome. Um, and the feedback was like overwhelmingly awesome. So yeah, so I was very happy with that. There's something happening now. Uh, people are waking up and they're realizing that wait a minute, I I actually do have control of my brain health and I have control of the rest of my biology too. And there's a study out there, you've probably come across it in your research that says neuroplasticity increases when you know about neuroplasticity. (laughs) Wow. So basically knowing that you can change your brain lets you change your brain. If you believe intelligence is fixed, you cannot increase your intelligence. Hmm. Once you believe it's variable, then suddenly your intelligence can change. It's amazing. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. it's also important to maintain your intelligence that you don't damage it with toxins. In Moldy, um, the documentary, by the way, quick plug, that would be um, moldymovie.com. 50,000 people have seen it, and we just wrapped up our free screening, but it's totally worth checking out, all the clips and stuff. In that, uh, Daniel Amen said, you can lose 15 IQ points. Your IQ might be 130. You get exposed to you breathe toxins, in this case, mold toxins in the air. And then your IQ might go down to 115. You're still smarter than average, 
but you're not where you were before. Hmm. And so if you're dealing with an older person or a younger person, it doesn't matter. If there are things inhibiting mitochondrial respiration in the brain, it can have an impact. And if you're already in a cognitively weak position, you're, you're starting to suffer from some of these effects of aging or yeah. these diseases of aging. That could be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. It's so interesting. And, you know, based on your research, I'm, I'm so excited to, to, you know, A, to watch your documentary, but then also to learn more. Because, I mean, fungi, what I've learned recently is a kingdom as diverse as the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom, you know. And, you know, mushrooms, they can either put you on a hallucinogenic trip. They can actually enhance your mm -hmm. brain function. I mean, there's... You yeah. know, there's great, you know, random control trials out there that show, you know, the lion's mane mushroom can yeah. actually, you know, r slow the decline and, re and reduce symptoms of mild cognitive impairment, can improve symptoms. Isn't that ridiculous that it's just insane. a simple mushroom could do that? Just a simple mushroom. And even the hallucinogenic ones like uh, uh, Amanita, Muscaria, some of the other ones, psilocybin, can do very beneficial things for the brain when used very occasionally and therapeutically rather than recreationally. Yeah. And so uh, it's it's shocking that we haven't paid more attention to this in just the overall history of medicine. It's just whatever antibiotics we can get, but there's all these other compounds that come out of these that are that are really important. Yeah, I mean, like penicillin, you know, exactly. It's like the most common medicinal mushroom, but there are so many others, you know, and we've only discovered a small fraction of the of the mushrooms that are out there. I mean, a few people realize this, but, you know, a huge percentage of our pharmaceuticals come from, you know, come from mushrooms. So it's really, it's really interesting. And so I don't doubt the point is that I don't doubt that um, that mold can have a destructive impact on your health. But then again, it could also, as you mentioned earlier, it could also make cheese. Yeah, it's not like mold is bad because it, uh, it, our soil is based on it, our food is based on it, we'd be surrounded by dead bodies without it. But it, that's just one thing, and it was my opportunity to plug Moldy Movie. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to talk with you more about was, uh, you're calling your documentary Breadhead, so Hmm. One of the bulletproof recommendations is really don't eat grains. Yeah. And that isn't just wheat, but most of the other grains as well. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. But why specifically are you looking at the brain and um, the brain and Alzheimer's disease and grains, not just gluten? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I see whole grain bread as being the ultimate processed food masquerading as a health staple. And no, <laughs> yeah, it, it's agreed. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you if you recognize the fact that your average slice of whole grain bread has a higher glycemic index than table sugar yeah. than pure sucrose. I mean, there's that. It affects your blood sugar quite profoundly. Mm -hmm. The CDC in 2012 ascertained that bread and rolls were America's number one source of dietary sodium. Now, I know that sodium, you know, in a lot of people does not lead to high blood pressure. But I think it's really the sodium to potassium balance that's, that's yeah, most and, important. And magnesium, right? And magnesium. Um, but... But essentially, when we think of processed foods, we think of foods that are really high in salt, really high in sugar. And so bread has those makings, those, those markings of a processed food. Not to mention the fact that bread is replete with gluten, which is a, an alien protein that induces gut permeability in everybody that is toxic for no, everybody. No, didn't you hear? There's some study that said only people see like need to do it. Like, like you're supposed to be angry and say, <laughs> yeah, I eat gluten because I can take it. Because yeah. I don't have celiac disease. Are, are you saying there's a study that refutes that, Max? Well, so here's the thing. I don't think that everybody is necessarily going to get sick from gluten. I've yeah, done an interview with one of the you know most renowned researchers in this field, and he stated that gluten is toxic for everybody, but not everybody's going to get sick from it. The same way that your body is fighting an invisible war with countless microorganisms mm -hmm. on a daily basis, even mold, and you are none the wiser to those to those yeah. battles because you've got a great immune system and you're doing things to counteract the you know the susceptibility to to those toxins. Gluten is no different, so it induces, you know, low-grade inflammation in everybody because yep. it, it lets things past, you know, the gut lining that shouldn't get past it. And whether or not it affects you now or decades into the future, I mean, inflammation can have an insidious effect. It can build up over time. And so, you know, my mom, who 
grew up in New York, you know, to her, eating a bagel was always vastly healthier than an egg because, you know, the cholesterol in eggs that <laughs> clog your arteries. I, and I thought that too as a kid. You know, so it's, a, it's just a really pervasive problem that I think we need to fight, you know. Um, so the reason why I brought up my mom is because she actually tested positive for gluten antibodies. And to this day does not have uh, gastrointestinal, you know, side effects from, mm -hmm. from consuming a bagel like that. But the research shows you that you can have neurological effects you know, from, from gluten that are extra intestinal, you know, what? they recently connected ALS to oh. celiac disease. Yeah. So I just think it's like, we're really at the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that is yet undiscovered, but we do also currently know a lot and we know enough to protect our brain health to the best of our ability. And I think that that's a battle worth fighting. I think that, you know, so, so if, if someone were to say, you know, I, I love cherry turnovers, I'll eat them now. <laughs> right. Uh, like, as a long-term health strategy, you're saying maybe that's not optimal. It's not because of, you know, the, the, the fact that it induces gut permeability in everybody. And, <laughs> in everybody, right? In everybody. Um, but I like them. I, I, this is the kind of level of discourse that comes through. I'm, I'm strong. It's not going to make me sick. I'm not celiac. But when I hear that, I, I actually feel sad for people because, like, okay, there isn't really a rational conversation to be had with someone who's yeah. taken that perspective they're going to do whatever self-destructive path they choose to do. And maybe it won't be self-destructive, but it isn't one that leads to optimal strength and resilience either. Right, right. Well, in that moment, they're being, they're listening to the Labrador brain, <laughs> as you always say, you know, and I think it's, it's constantly the battle between the prefrontal cortex and that reptilian brain that just wants things that are sweet, that are, you know, that, that provide that instant gratification. But that also makes you sick, you know, like the body, the body prefers, you know, short-term survival over long-term health. And I think that we need to think about our long-term health uh, in the choices that we make at the kitchen table. It's, it's true, but let's face it, long-term health, I, all, this, all these years running the Silicon Valley Health Institute, and a lot of people think about long-term health when it runs out, <laughs> when they're 59. Yeah, it's a problem. Right? Yeah. Why, why wasn't your mother thinking about her long-term health before this? Well, the problem is so my mom, my mom was, she was health, she was health conscious, but she is from an era where the recommendations from forces larger than herself, yeah. uh, were hard to, not only hard to ignore, mm -hmm. but counter opinions were simply not available because, you know, the media channels were less, she didn't have the internet, you know? And so I think that today we're at a unique time where we're at this like interesting apex where we have enough research and the fact that technology really has led to this democratization of information. Um, and we don't have to rely on, you know, the government, we don't have to rely on the USDA, you know, to, to, we don't even have to re rely on our local doctors to, to get the truth out there. And, and so I think that we're at a really interesting time where we actually can make choice informed choices for ourselves. And so that's what I'm trying to do with Breadhead is that I'm trying to like, you know, I'm not demonizing any one food group necessarily more, more than I am just like providing the information so that people can make this choice for themselves. I mean, in the, in the Kickstarter teaser that went viral, you know, I posed the question at the beginning, what if America's most feared disease is a choice that we make at checkout? As long as you're making that choice, as you, as long as you're aware of that choice, then make, then make the choice yeah. and your fate is in your hands, you know? So I think that that's, that's the best that we can do as teachers, you know? It's one of the reasons there's a, a bulletproof diet roadmap it is exactly that. If you don't have a roadmap, you just go there and, and you're being health conscious, but you're probably making decisions based on false assumptions. You might be a rational actor. You're, you're going to do the good thing and you'll eat, you know, masses of, of raw kale and nothing else, if, if you believe that's what's gonna make you stronger. And if it works, that's great. But if the data you have is flawed, or you're eating whole grain bread, like I used to as a kid when I was fat and my brain didn't work very well, not knowing that it has a morphine opiate-like effect in the brain. Okay. And so you, you just do this and you do it over the course of a lifetime and you are paying attention to your long-term health, you are being health conscious and you were getting the exact opposite of what you bargained for because you didn't have the tools, especially 20, 30 years ago, to track what the effect of these things were on your biology. We have the tools now, so someone can tell you to do something and you can try it 
And if it doesn't work after six months or after a year, you can say, all right, maybe that person is, and this is what people have to say, you know, they're a, a, a con artist, a scammer, a snake oil, a quack. Okay, those are all ad hominem t- attacks. Those are BS. What's going on is the person was wrong. Okay, being wrong is very different than being a con artist. Mm. And so those aren't words that I use towards even the doctors, the the low fat extremists, the <laughs> ones who were responsible in part for my obesity. Hmm. Um, I don't think that they're quacks. I don't think that they're con artists or scammers, even though some of them have made enormous amounts of money off peddling this low fat, yeah. basically low calorie nonsense. But what they are is people who are trying to help they're just not helping. Yeah, a lot of them are misled. I mean, you know, as you know, nutritional training in medical school is, you know, next to nothing. I mean, extra curri- U.S. medical schools, their their curriculums ignore exercise for the most part. I mean, there was a study recently that came out where they where they assessed the amount of exercise training that mm-hmm. that uh, future MDs were getting, and it was next to nothing, despite the fact that exercise can prevent and treat so many diseases. And so I think that they're just, they're uninformed, but then also like the, you know, nutritional science itself is pretty confusing. I mean, like the other day I saw a study, you know, that they were feeding mice, uh, you know, high fat, low sugar diet. A lot of the times they'll, they'll research the effects of saturated fat by combining it with sugar. So you really mm-hmm. get no sense of the impact yeah. of each variable. And it's hydrogenated saturated fat. Hydrogenated saturated fat. <laughs> And I've actually done the research to look into the rat chow that they give these it's, rats when they test they, when they test the effect of dietary fat on their you know on their lipid markers, for example. They use corn oil. Yeah. So I mean, nutritional science is in such a weird state. It's impossible to do this kind of research over the long term with humans. That's why I really respect the work that uh, Gary Tabbs and Peter Atia are doing with with mm-hmm. the news side because they're really looking to raise money to do better research. Okay. Gary was just on and they just raised like $40 million, wow. which is uh, I think from the Arnold Foundation. Wow. And I'm like, go Gary, because that kind of work is going to shed some light on this. And you know, maybe we're both wrong and we really should be eating a tofu based low fat mm-hmm. diet. Just the evidence is very much against that now. And I, I would be shocked because I can look at the effect on testosterone, the effect on inflammation and all these things those don't work. But maybe there's some magic group of people where those work sustainably and they don't suck energy and willpower. But I think that Gary's work is going to help get to the bottom of obesity and we can really solve some of these problems. So recently, I think it was a pharmaceutical sales rep uh, said something (laughs) in the Wall Street Journal about how you know coconut oil and exercise and diet aren't going to cure Alzheimer's. We need drugs. (laughs) And what do you say to people like that who who are, are just either untrained or unaware of the lifestyle factors affect aging. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I remain, you know, open-minded to all sides. So I'm, I'm willing to, you know, have a conversation with um, the author of that article in the Wall Street Journal. He works for a, you know, he works with an organization that, that works to look for a far, they fund pharmaceutical research for a cure for Alzheimer's disease. There are many hypotheses, hypothesi, hypotheses, as to why <laughs> I noticed I didn't correct any of those because I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there are a few ideas as to why you know Alzheimer's disease develops. One of those is a an amyloid hypothesis that, mm-hmm. that this buildup of this toxic protein amyloid beta in the brain is really the the beginning of Alzheimer's disease and ultimately what leads to the you know neur- neuronal death. Um, that's one idea, and so he does not seem open to the idea of prevention via dietary and lifestyle modifications. So he knows what causes the amyloid plaques to form, right? You know, they, they, they don't know. Oh, so it must not be diet or lifestyle. Right. It would have nothing to do He wait. basically, yeah. <laughs> like, where does this research come? We need a drug, but we don't know how it got there. Right. So, so while I do, you know, think that, you know, his sentiment that, you know, more money needs to go into ph- pharmaceutical research, I think that that is fine. I agree with that. But we also need to focus on the idea of prevention because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And once you realize the fact that once you are showing your first symptom, this is a 30 year disease process already set into motion. To me, the imperative is there. It's clear. We need to, we need to have that. We need to be having this conversation about prevention. 
And you know it begins in the brain before any of the features of Alzheimer's disease, including this plaque buildup, including you know memory dysfunction, is what's called glucose hypometabolism. So impaired, yeah, impaired glucose metabolism in the brain. And that stems from, who knew, insulin resistance in the brain, in the most metabolically hungry organ in your body. So, so it, I've definitely read about Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. Do you like that name? Do you describe that? I mean, to that? It's, it's a hypothesis, but it's a hypothesis for which there is a lot of corroborating evidence. So this is not, I didn't coin this term. This is a term, mm -hmm. a term coined by a researcher at Brown University. And there is ample evidence to suggest that this might be, in fact, true. I mean, that's part, that's part of the reason why, you know, in trials, MCT oil has been shown to help alleviate symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease. Just last year, they tested an, an insulin nasal spray. Which, you an know, insulin nasal spray. An insul insulin nasal spray. Okay. Yeah. And how does insulin nasal early... spray, but you just, you went from talking about MCT to insulin nasal spray. I totally missed the connection there. Well, the connection is that MCT oil provides ketones to, to ailing mitochondria. So mitochondria that can no longer utilize glucose effectively because they, they've become deaf to insulin, which is the signaling hormone that alerts your cells to the fact that there's sugar, you know, to feed them. Um, MCT oil provides a, a, a sort of alternate fuel source, like a hybrid car, you know, an alternate and cleaner burning fuel source for these cells that are no longer able to properly utilize glucose. Um, insulin can help because insulin, you know, provides a louder knock, you know, onto the mitochondria of those cells so that they can, you know, they can at least use some more glucose. So you probably didn't know this, but just about every one of the biohacks I put you through in the biohacking lab downstairs today increases mitochondrial efficiency, helps to grow new ones, makes them work better. And a lot of the supplement recommendations that I make on the Bulletproof site, some of the things that I, I manufacture even, are there to support healthy mitochondrial function. Because screw Alzheimer's, you're not going to feel good after a night of drinking if your mitochondria aren't doing well. You're not going to perform well on your next test. Your brain won't do what it's capable of doing if your mitochondria don't work. Like they're the spark of life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your, your brain at rest is using as much energy as a leg muscle running a marathon. So the idea that, you know, I mean, if people, when they think about type two diabetes, they think about it as this black and white diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? Um, that your hemoglobin A1C is at a point at which your doctor makes a, a diagnosis. You're either pre-diabetic or you've got full blown type two diabetes. But the truth is that it's actually, it's a spectrum and you can show signs of insulin resistance in various organs of your body. You can be insulin resistant in your brain. You can be insulin resistant in your arm, you know? Uh, so the fact that your brain is so energy hungry, yeah. that it uses 20% of your base metabolic rate, it doesn't take a neuroscientist, to, a neuroscientist to realize that when there's something metabolically awry going on in your body, you're gonna have an impingement on brain health and cognition. There's another guy, and I, I apologize, I'm not remembering who it is. It's either Daniel Amen or John Gray, and, and I've read two books in the last couple of weeks, mm. uh, one by each of them, and I'm just swapping in my brain which one writes about this idea of creative, uh, creative type ADD where some brains might require more energy than others. And I'm pretty sure it was one of those, those two authors. Hmm. And so if you have a high energy brain, you're probably going to feel cognitive declines earlier in life if you don't feed it right or you get insulin resistance. And who knows, maybe you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease much later in life. But this idea that the brain is hungry for energy, you better give it energy, makes sense. Um, what about then if you're on, say, a, a low calorie diet and you're struggling with these symptoms of Alzheimer's or 30 years before Alzheimer's that you're dealing with this insulin resistant thing? And is there a problem? There's just not enough calories for the brain to function? No, it's really about insulin sensitivity, okay. which you can enhance by, you know, going on a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, exercise is one of the mm -hmm. greatest things that you can do for insulin sensitivity. Um, but then there are other sort of factors that you can use to sort of you know, bolster the situation. I mean, cocoa flavanols have been shown to, you know, uh, increase insulin sensi sensitivity. Oh, yeah. So essentially you want to be, oh man, do you have I got, I got some good, good dark chocolate here Amazing. for you. Amazing. We'll have to, cocoa I'll flavanols some of this. Are, are incredible for here, you. Here we go. Normally I you know, don't really eat on Bulletproof <laughs> Radio, but, and surprisingly, this isn't Bulletproof chocolate. This is a single estate, super clean chocolate, 
It comes so out of New York, and I'm going to be putting this in one of my upcoming quarterly boxes. If you don't know about the Dave Asprey quarterly box, go to quarterly.co. And is this like epically? Good job. Oh my God. The same guys who own the plantation process the beans. And uh, these are the sort of things that I source. I'm like, it's so good. This is bomb. So you're basically suggesting that we could um, use cocoa flavanols to influence brain health? Absolutely. Man, yeah. life is tough. They found there's you know, research that, you know, there's evidence that it, it can reverse age-related cognitive decline. Um, it's just incredible for you. So did, did that look scripted? <laughs> no. I totally wasn't planning this. <laughs> I had no idea we were going to talk you're, about cocoa flavanols. I just happened to have really good chocolates. Yeah, you me. know that you're a great pitch man. <laughs> you, should, you should come, you know, we should pitch some content together. All right, let's do it. Wow. We'll go talk to Vice. Let's talk to Vice. Um, yeah, so these are all the things that, that you can be doing. So that's why I've adopted for myself a low-carb diet. Yeah. I used to believe that the more whole grains I ate, the better my health would be. Um, and I, you know, I worked out a lot. I was never dealing with, like, weight problems and mm -hmm. the like. But, um, but you know, I, I used to feel sluggish after meals. Um, yeah. And so once I did this research for myself, like I, you know, I just, I, it was very black and white to me, you know, the, the way that I should eat for brain health. I mean, the, the dietary pattern for which the most evidence exists that is pro neuroprotective is the Mediterranean diet. But just because mm -hmm. the Mediterranean diet, you know, incorporates, you know, grains doesn't mean that it can't be improved on. The Mediterranean diet is an inherently higher fat diet. And, and can anyone actually identified what the Mediterranean diet is? Because I have seen radically different people, right? Oh, this is Mediterranean. I'm like, actually, no, that doesn't look Mediterranean to me. It was 40% grains yeah. versus having a little bit of grain. And, I, and so I think Mediterranean diet is, is like this amorphous mass. You're absolutely right. It's like right. eat olive oil. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh, and think. salad with feta. That, that, right. that, other than that, like... <laughs> well, you're 100% right. I mean, wild-caught fish. I mean, by the way, since getting to this island, I've been eating tons of <laughs> wild salmon. It's amazing. I love living here. Yeah, it's so great. God. What a life. So, I mean, there's that. There is olive oil. I mean, olive oil has, okay, extra virgin olive oil has a compound in it called oleocanthal. That's almost medicinal in its health effects. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's what's responsible for that peppery feeling at the back of the throat. It's been shown in studies to clear brains of that amyloid plaque that builds up yep. in the brain, as well as selectively causing cancer cells to commit suicide. And you can damage those compounds by heating your olive oil. It, it's one of those those oils that really you ought to put it on your salad. Mm. Add it uh, like a steak tagliatella or tagliatelle, where you pour it on your steak after you cook it. But uh, I'm always kind of sad when people take olive oil, which is probably counterfeit anyway, because 69% of olive oil has canola in it in the average store. Yes. But you get real olive oil, like use it medicinally, like use it in its whole raw form, because that yeah. changes how it affects the body. So right, you're, you're talking about all this good stuff in there, just make sure it's impact, or intact when, yeah. when you use it. No, super smart and, and absolutely true. I think a lot of the health benefits of foods do get lost uh, in the cooking process, and I know you talk about this in your book, um, but for example, like even your best feet, slight cut of grass fed beef, you know, you cook it on a grill and it, you know, you char the hell out of it. You're actually creating, you know, advanced glycation end products on the yeah. surface of the meat. So, I mean, these are all the things you don't want to drive yourself crazy, I think, but these are all the things that you just need to be mindful of. You get in the habit of throwing your meat on the grill every night and that habit leads to heterocyclic amines and um, PAHs and some of these other toxic byproducts, the AGE formation. Um, I've seen a couple studies around AGEs. Some say that eating them is bad. Some say that eating them is not that big of a deal. When they form in your body, when you eat high sugar, they're always bad. Yes. But this complex of basically cancer-causing, brain inflammation-causing things that come from burning your meat regularly, it doesn't mean you can never enjoy barbecue. It just means if you choose to eat it every single night or eat it frequently, without knowing it was a choice for flavor that's one thing but if you're like i want to be old and you know i want to look good and feel good 20 years from now 30 40 years from now knowing that mm -hmm. and acknowledging it but not making that you have to be perfect but just right. changing the, the direction but not perfection right i mean again like people can live how they want to live you know live and let live uh, you know i think is a is a fair you know uh way to sort of Pre, you know, it's a it's a fair perspective to sort of use when you preach these sorts of ideals. Um, but 
you know, knowing what you know, I feel like there's a responsibility to disseminate these ideas because not everybody is going to spend all day on PubMed the way that I do and the, the way I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think the responsibility comes with, you know, sort of being really into this research, having a knack for it, being able to communicate it, but then also like letting people make their own decisions. You mm -hmm. know, I've had to, you know, I can't even tell you, man, like undoing, tr attempting to undo decades of dietary dogma with my mom is impossible. It's impossible. You know, she just has, you know, ideas about health that I can't change no matter how hard I try. And so at the end of the day, I just have to be like, you know what, I've like done, done this research and like, here's, here's my perspective and the perspective of the best medical evidence that's available today. Um, but if she doesn't want to adhere to it, I can't let it affect the relationship. Now. Here's the tough thing. I haven't been able to change my grandmother, but she's 90 something and just sort of, she's going to do what she's going to do. But most of the rest of my family in their 60s up 70s um, have made dietary changes based on the Bulletproof Diet, partly, okay, and now it's a, you know, there's a New York Times bestselling author in the family, maybe we should pay attention. But even before that, so we go to a family reunion and I'd make them Bulletproof Coffee. And that's not a, a pitch for Bulletproof Coffee, but it's that they could feel the difference. Like, whoa, like my brain feels a little bit different. I like how I feel. And it's one thing to go, look, if you do this, 20 years from now, you're gonna like how you feel. Mm -hmm. Like we suck as organisms with long feedback windows and a one minute feedback window is an eternity to the Labrador in your brain. A 30 year or a 20 year, it, it's invisible. Rationally, you know you should, but in terms of behavior change, it doesn't motivate most people unless they have a really big motivator like seeing it happen to a family member. Uh, for the rest of us though, let's say you're 25 and you're hearing this and you're like, all right, I might get Alzheimer's when I'm old, but that's like so far away. You know, I, I have so many more important things like, you know, the attractive blonde across the way, <laughs> right? What advice would you offer for someone who's earlier in life? What can they do that's not burdensome and not annoying that's going to reduce their chances of getting Alzheimer's later in life? I mean, I think that the, you know, I can't under state the importance of exercise, which, you know, leads to the expression of profound neurotrophic proteins uh, in the what, brain. What kind of exercise are we talking about? Well, aerobic exercise. Um, like, like jazzercise? Like jazzercise. <laughs> By the way, if you're like under 40, you don't even know what jazzercise is probably. <laughs> Do you know what jazzercise is? Uh, I vaguely kind of. I, feel <laughs> I like just was just... dating myself. <laughs> so, so back in, uh, it must have been the 80s or something, I don't know. Um, what, I was a, a young teenager when this was popular. <laughs> but adults would put on like leotards, men and women apparently, and they would get in these groups of people, kind of like a modern aerobics class, but they would like do lame, like jazzy, weird dance moves. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, probably the beginning of the aerobics exercise, but I still laugh at it because you see those 80s videos of people in headbands yeah. and leg warmers, and like that was jazzercise. But but so, so when you say aerobic exercise, like how intense, how long is what I'm really asking? Well, I mean, I think the more you can do, the better. I mean, there was really just, like just so ten miles a day. Well, you don't you don't want to overtrain, you oh. know, and, and listen to your listen to your body. Okay. Um, but by doing aerobic exercise, I mean you actually grow new neurons. You grow mm -hmm. new brain cells just by doing aerobic exercise. In fact, you've got neurons in your eyes. Right. You know, doing exercise is great for your eyes as well, for the neurons in your eyes. No, you say aerobic exercise, but what about yoga, which also affects your eyes and affects your neurons and your BDNF and all that? Like why aerobic versus strength versus uh, movement versus functional movement versus weightlifting? Well, weightlifting has also proven to be effective uh, mm -hmm. in you know, reducing your risk for things like dementia. Um, I think that we don't know the reason why, you know, one versus another, you know, it but probably you, has something to do with brain perfusion. You is, do know that aerobics outperforms weight training for BDNF or uh, brain derived neurotrophic factors? Okay. I can tell you that the research has been uh -huh. done with aerobic exercise. Ah, so, okay. Because yeah. that's what's been cool for the past 30 years. I mean, whether or not like yoga has the same effect, I mm -hmm. don't know. That has not been studied to my knowledge. Um, but I do know that aerobic exercise appears to be great for your brain health. I mean, it increases blood flow everywhere in the body. And so. Increasing blood flow absolutely is important. And the reason I'm sort of pushing on this yeah. is that the bulletproof recommendations are for your cardio to increase your ejection fractions, which is the amount of blood your heart can pump on a single beat basis, mm -hmm. which is a great measure of cardiac fitness. And the best single most effective way to do that is to go for a 400 meter sprint. 
basically run like a tiger's chasing you until uh, you're, you're done and then walk for a little while and do it again <laughs> until you basically throw up. And that takes about 10, 15 minutes for the average person. Well, I, if I had to make an educated guess, I would say that that is probably just as beneficial for your brain health. Okay. Um, I tend to think so as well, but yeah. I'm wondering, because you've dug more in on this aerobic exercise brain connection than I have. Yeah, I mean, I think that just in general, all, all exercise is good for your brain, which mm -hmm. in and of itself is a counterintuitive concept. But the research really has shown that with aerobic exercise, uh, you not only upregulate BDNF expression, which mm -hmm. is brain-derived neurotrophic factor, it you know ensures the survival of not only existing neurons but cre that but creates and promotes the creation of new brain cells. Um, you know it feels good, all kinds of like feel-good endorphins, but then it also increases insulin sensitivity. So it's really a you know an incredible. Uh, boon for, I mean, not only your cardiovascular health, but also your brain health. So if you are doing this every day, every other, every other day, sort of what's the ideal prescription for this? I mean, I think that the more you do while listening to your own body uh, without overtraining, the better. And, you know, I mean, people with a genetic uh, an increased genetic risk for Alzheimer's can negate that genetic risk by doing exercise. So um, I really think that it's a, a personal thing as far as brain health goes. You have to listen to your body. You don't want to overtrain. Um, but in general, being less sedentary. Uh, yeah, moving around a lot is really important. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's incredible for your brain health. I also think that you want to you want to balance that with some really serious sleep. Sleep is incredibly you know beneficial for the brain for a multitude of reasons. Um, and I really do think that, uh, especially young people who find themselves, you know, increasingly just glued to their smartphones, and I'm guilty of this as mm -hmm. well, um, I think that, that smartphone use at night has a destructive effect on I, brain health. I gotta show you something cool. Okay. So, on my iPhone is a Zentech filter, and this is something that I manufacture. And it is invisible, like you, you can't really, you can't really see it, but what it's doing is it's filtering out just a narrow spectrum of blue, the spectrum of blue that most suppresses melatonin. Wow. So you can still see colors on your phone during the day. It doesn't filter out every spectrum of blue, like a, a, an orange screen on the phone mm. would do that more effectively, but it does take out the worst part. So it's a harm reduction strategy that lets you still, okay, you know, I am going to look at my phone for, as an alarm clock, for instance. You can do that. So I'm all arranged, I'll ship you a Zentech Sleep Shield, and we just launched that maybe two months ago, but it's one of those things that's not perfect. But if you're going to look at your phone, and let's face it, you probably are gonna look at your phone, you might as well not turn off your melatonin when you do it. Uh, I mean, 100%. I think that is incredibly important. I mean, your brain can't tell the difference between looking at your smartphone at night and the sun being out. So, you know, that we know from a study done this year that using an e-reader before bed, you know, shortens the amount of time spent in REM sleep, makes it take longer to actually fall asleep. So, you know, filtering out blue light, I think, is incredible. And we know that sleep, you know, is just incredible for the brain in many ways. You know, memory consolidation, your memories are being consolidated when you go to sleep. I actually just did a vlog about this on my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, youtube.com slash Max uh, and then the incredible glymphatic system, you know, the ducts in your brain that your brain uses to clean itself, you know, during your, you know, slow wave sleep of, uh, slow wave phase of sleep. You know, it's, it's incredible. So I think that like all of these insights are incredibly empowering and, um, what can I say? Neurodegenerative diseases are just, you know, shrouded in doom and gloom. And I think that, that it doesn't have to be so gloomy, you know, it's, it's not all doom. I think that we've got enough insights today where we can really make a dent in, in this category of diseases. And so when we talk about all these different things that, are, that in studies have effects on brain health and you look at doing all of them to some extent, not doing any of them perfectly. And you stack it up against uh, someone who says, we need a drug for Alzheimer's. I mean, does it just make you like bewildered to, to look at that perspective? We do want a drug for Alzheimer's. Yeah. But the approach of do everything that's going to help now, yeah, well, and maybe we'll have a drug later if they're even right that amyloid plaques are are the cause, not just a symptom of something else like eating crap all the time. Yeah, I mean, Dave, like this has been this has become the story of my life, and you hit the nail on the head so perfectly. Um, I mean, I actually think that that article that came out, and, and I'm sure you can you know find a way to link to it. Yeah, we'll was actually was actually anti scientific because there was research that came out this year. 
um, from the Karolinska Institute, the finger study. I, I hear they have the hottest doctors at the Karolinska Institute. Right. Right. <laughs> my, my wife, Dr. Lana, <laughs> is trained at the Karolinska Institute. So that was a shout out to my wife, not everyone else there. No, well, they're I mean, Swedish. The Swedish bikini team all went to the Karolinska Institute. I've never been, but I would love to go and find a <laughs> wife from there. Um, but yeah, so they, 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 they announced the results of the study this year as the first ever randomized control trial where they applied a battery of lifestyle modifications and dietary modifications on one group that they did not give to the other group. And the group where they had all these, you know, different interventions uh, faced a much slower rate of cognitive decline. In fact, some of them didn't even, you know, some of them saw a reversal of symptoms. And I, you know, I think that that study is definitely worth looking up. Uh, but the idea that our lifestyle and, and, and dietary factors don't matter to me is just an absurd concept. So when you, when you realize that this underutilization of glucose begins uh, before any of these features, then the impetus there to me is really to, to, you know, make sure that your cells are as insulin sensitive as possible. So the type three diabetes uh, hypothesis really to me is very empowering because type two diabetes we know is a lifestyle disease. We know it's a disease, you know, reaching epidemic proportions here. Well, we're not in the States right now, but in the States, but as well, you know, many emerging economies are seeing type two diabetes rates reach epidemic proportions. And this is from the industrialization of food, you know, the rise of fast food, you know, in, in countries that have maybe been resistant to that up until now. Um, and so just, you know, the, the blood sugar epidemic, the epidemic of, you know, desk jobs and, and the like, uh, to me, it's just, you know, it's tragic and it's avoidable. Yeah. And so the idea that our brain health can be, can falter due to these same factors, to me, it's incredibly, it's scary, but it's also incredibly empowering. It gives you more control, but with that control comes responsibility, right? Yeah. And and I asked, uh, who was it? Um, Craig Venter, uh, the guy behind the Human Genome Project. And he gave this, this great talk at a Peter Diamandis event. And I, I've had a chance to spend some time with Peter. He wrote a blurb for the Bulletproof Diet book. And you know, he, he's one of those guys like launching things into space and just looking at really big things. And Craig on stage is saying, well, we have all this science coming in five more years. We're going to know this. And, and I said, all right, Craig, you know, there, there's 14 million people have downloaded Bulletproof Radio. Given the set of knowledge you have now, what should we do today that has the best chance of working if we don't know for sure? Or should we all just have pizza and beer and, and not worry about it? And what Craig said was astounding. He said, let's talk about it over pizza and beer. <laughs> and, and afterwards, um, we had a longer conversation. And he said, you know, Dave, I don't want to make recommendations that aren't correct. Like, like, it is part and parcel to my belief in science and all that. And the problem is that correct is asymptotic. Because asymptotic, it means uh, um, that you can approach something, but you can never quite get there. Because we think it's correct. You know, the, the, the Newtonian model for motion of the planets, well, it works pretty well, except it's not actually correct. It's a model. And I'm concerned that even once we completely take apart the human genome all the way, and I'm signed up to do that, I'll be one of the first you know, thousand or so people to have mm -hmm. my, my genome sequenced. Once we do that, we forgot about the exposome. The exposome is the set of all the environmental variables that your genome was exposed to throughout the course of your life. Wow. That's kind of hard to track, but that's exactly what you're hitting at here, saying, well, we don't know all of that, and we probably never will, but we can say, we know this does this, so give me more of this and less of this. And that's the same reason. That's why there's a roadmap, but not a set of edicts on yeah. the Bulletproof Diet. And that perspective is new. I mean, I think that we have to, we have to adhere to the science, but we also shouldn't let science limit us. You know, like these long-term nutritional you know studies with humans i mean they're so difficult to do um and you know animal studies can only get us so far especially when you realize that a lot of these studies regarding fats and lipids and things like that are done with corn oil and done you know with crazy confounding variables like saturated fat and sugar you know you really have to like you know dig into the research but that being said, I mean, there is, there are scientists out there that are doing incredible work and there is the insight that's out there. There is insight out there that really, you know, does illuminate um, how we might eat for better health, cardiovascular health, brain health, you know, and I think the for, for every one of those, there's a confounding thing. Like we, we've got, you know, the, the Ornish camp saying you need to eat no fat, essentially, like, like very, very low levels 
uh, of fat and a diet rich in whole grains. Yeah. And you're like, but, and they, they'll cite studies. They'll cite studies, but they're best. I mean, for example, a study came out, you know, I saw a study headline, you know, grace my desktop, uh, my Facebook news feed a couple weeks ago that said that a, a high carbohydrate diet provides the same benefits as calorie restriction. You look into that what study. What the hell? Well, it was, an, it was a, well, that was the headline. You look into the study. First of all, it's an animal study. And second of all, the study, the, they were feeding animals like 80% of their calorie intake was from protein. Um, so that was a high carbohydrate protein. Based well, because diet? that was the that was the control. It was oh. a it was a high protein, low carb diet, like super super high protein. And as you know, like you don't advocate a high protein diet. No, protein it is insulin messes you up. Like, yeah. yeah, and and so they match that against a really high carbohydrate diet, and the high carbohydrate diet in that case did better than the super 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 high protein diet. So. Um, but that was an animal, an animal study. And I just think it was not, it wasn't sound. I actually sent that to my, you know, my researcher friends and I was like, what do you guys think of this? And he was like, you would never, you know, in a human diet approach that, that level of protein. And that actually can, can create issues. Yeah. Like kidney problems and ammonia levels. And it makes you cranky and tired and, and puts you in an adrenal state. So you yell at people all the time and yeah. it's, it's not good to overdo protein. Right. And, and the idea that metabolic markers on a high carbohydrate diet uh, would improve to me is just like, doesn't, doesn't make any sense. I also take issue with, with studies, even if they're looking at, at Alzheimer's or brain health or whatever other outcome, when they talk about a high fat diet, it is meaningless to talk about fat. It, it turns out one of the medium chain fats and, and the, the term medium chain was done by a chemist looking, counting carbons but not a biochemist. So you had mm. no idea what actually went where, what was processed by the liver, what wasn't. Mm. So there's been a little like trickery where people are saying, oh, lauric acid, the most common cheap part of coconut oil is a medium chain. It is legally, but metabolically, it's not a true medium chain. It's a chemical medium chain, but not a biological medium chain. Mm. And it's interesting because the ones that bypass the liver that go straight to energy in the brain are the ones that make you feel the best. For sure, but the other sneaky medium chain no one talks about is C6. Mm. This is a fat that is highly irritating to your, your mucosa. If you don't get all of it out of a refined coconut oil, it actually causes disaster pants. But a high fat diet technically could be all C6. Right? And if you ate that, it would mess you up on so many different levels. Like you basically couldn't get off the bathroom. So there are evidence, high fat diets or high saturated fat diets make you crap your pants. I mean, and you could construct a study that way compared to a pure corn syrup diet. Corn syrup is better than high fat. But number one, the fact that it's high fat doesn't mean anything unless you know what kind of fat and whether the fat's oxidized or not. Right. And, and the, it's the same thing goes animal protein versus plant protein. Rice and the nerve gas is a plant protein. <laughs> Spider venom is an animal protein. Th those distinctions are irrelevant for nutritional research. Yeah, 100%. Uh, and, they, and they shouldn't be. Well, I mean, I think that like nutrition, nutrition scientists needs to really you know do a study where you're giving mice olive oil you know instead of the soybean oil mm -hmm. that you're using to yeah. you know make broader recommendations on how much fat humans should consume and, and if you source the olive oil don't go to the store and buy the cheapest olive oil there and if you do give them olive oil you got to test what's in it because it said olive oil on this on, on the thing but if you don't know what impurities and you don't know that a lot of oil, olive oil is cut with canola what you're finding is in your nice, beautiful write-up and with all your graphs, we sourced XYZ brand, you know, generic olive oil, but we never tested even one sample to verify that it was what we thought it was. A lot of these researchers get their rat chef in the same place from yeah. manufacturers of rat food. So, mm -hmm. so it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult thing. You know, you have to like read the research. Um, but yeah, actually one of my favorite papers is, uh, it's called the disease modifying and neuroprotective effects of the ketogenic diet. Oh, I know this paper. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> paper. Um, and it came, it came out only a couple of years ago. Uh, and it talks about the, the virtues of, of eating a high fat uh, diet for a high specific fat diet though, right? Not a high corn oil diet. Well, it, it just says like the value of being in ketosis for things. Okay. It begins with epilepsy. You know, there's been a ton of research yeah. that, that shows that that's beneficial, uh, for, you know, patients with epilepsy, but then also the potential for, you know, for Alzheimer's disease, for Parkinson's disease. Um, so that's definitely like a, an important read, I think. At this point, when someone says, oh, you know, there, there's no validity to diets with ketosis, there's so much evidence that, that you have to be specifically excluding massive amounts of data to fit your view of the world. And I, 
I have worked on, on experiments on myself where I'm in ketosis for long periods of time and I didn't have great outcomes. But I also know I've had lots of people on the podcast who really do. Uh, they can do ketosis for two years straight without ever, ever leaving ketosis and they're happy as clams. So I found for me that a cyclical ketosis diet works and after having talked with a lot of Bulletproof followers over time, I found that if you're in nutritional ketosis all the time, that quite often it creates adrenal stress. But not always. It depends on your metabolism. So when you dip in and you dip out, it tends to cause the body to remain sensitive to insulin versus getting insulin resistant, which can happen when you're on a, in a state of ketosis all the time. Yeah. So it's kind of like surfing that line of ketosis provides the most energy for me. It's like it's like, you know, using, you know, your it's like turning your body's metabolism into like a nest thermostat that nice. lets, you know so that it can regulate itself because your body is like the most advanced hybrid car in the universe you know you don't tell your prius when to switch from gas to electric and vice versa because the prius does it for you well so can your body yeah you know in fact by not allowing your body to do that you're undermining mm -hmm. incredible uh genetic capacities to rebuild to protect and so i just think it's like Again, giving the people the tools to do that, to, to hack their own biology in that sense, I think is, um, is incredibly empowering. Well, we're, uh, we're coming up on, on the end of the show, but there's a couple things that I'm going to do different because we're here at the Bulletproof <laughs> Labs in, in the biohacking facility. Um, first, I want to ask you the final question here. And then uh, I'm going to show people who are watching on video uh, what it looks like upstairs. And we'll save for another, probably a full video where we do a tour of what's going on downstairs. Cause we, we kind of worked you over today. Uh, you were in the flow tank, uh, we electrically stimulated your muscles and we put you in the hyperbaric chamber and all sorts of craziness. Yeah, this is, by the way, it was an incredible day. And uh, this is gonna be on munchies, which is a food vertical uh, under Vice, which is an incredible, uh, you know, publication platform um, and you can find out when that uh, goes live by following me on Twitter at Max Lugavere and I'm sure Dave. Will yeah, we'll, we'll definitely post a link to that. That'd be awesome. And uh, the other thing is I'm going to turn the camera around so you're seeing the set but I'm actually going to show you what the kitchen looks like because I have the coolest orange refrigerator you've ever seen. It's made by a company called Smeg and it actually matches the bulletproof colors but it also looks like it was made like in 1950 and it's just awesome yeah. so i'll, I'll kind of just walk you through real quick what this amazing kitchen looks like because you're going to get to see a lot more of this because i'm going to start making recipes for the bulletproof cookbook that's coming up here so i'm actually going to show you as i'm cooking the food over the next many months that won't be part of bulletproof radio it'll be on our youtube channel and when you uh, when you subscribe to that, I'll just occasionally say, look, this is what I'm having for dinner and I'm going to cook it. And Max, next time you're up here, I'm actually going to make you cook dinner with me as well. And we can put extra gluten not in the food. <laughs> that'd be that'd be perfect. That'd be All right. awesome. so, so given that, tell me, you have three recommendations for people who want to perform better based on all the research you've done, all the things you know in your life and you want to perform better for long periods of time. What are the three most important th pieces of advice you could give them? I think um, definitely reduce, you know, cut out sugar from your diets, eat a low carbohydrate diet, try going gluten free if you're not already. Um, you know, embrace healthful fats. The brain is desperate for good fat. Yeah. I mean, good fat, you know, makes up your cell membranes that, you know, by consuming DHA fat, which is replete in, you know, wild salmon, fish oil, things like that. You actually, you can also boost that, that neurotrophic factor in the brain, BDNF, which is so important. Um, the third, would, or the second rather, would be exercise. You know, don't be afraid to exercise and know that by exercising you are, you know, doing incredibly beneficial things for your brain health. Things that no known pharmaceutical on the planet has the power to do. Um, that means we need more pharmaceuticals. The exercise pill is coming. Right, more pharmaceuticals. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, again, sleep, I think, is really important. I, I'm definitely guilty. I can't wait to get the, the lens cover from it, It's called Zentech. Zentech. Yeah, it's yeah. on the Bulletproof website, Bulletproof store, but I'll send you one. That dude, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think the blue light emitted from smartphones is pretty destructive. And, you know, when you're sleeping, your brain is actually cleaning itself. And, and by the way, um, Apple, Samsung, we're watching you. Why the hell 
is it not already built into the operating system? And why don't you just source LEDs that don't do this to our bodies? It, this is on you. And I'll stop selling the Zentech Shield when you start making iPhones that don't mess with people's sleep. It's not okay. You know this. We're watching you. All right, sorry. Thank I'm you, so No, I mean. <laughs> it's dude. their fault. Like, they know. <laughs> it's true. No, it's, it's, you know, definitely. Apple, come on, please. Um, take my money, just like, you know, <laughs> reduce the blue light that comes from my smartphone at night. I'll pay more for less blue light, good idea. Exactly. Um, and so that's it, embrace healthful fats. You know, be mindful of the food that you're eating, not in the, you know, meditative sort of sense, uh, but in, this, in the idea that, you know, food is information. You know, with olive oil, you're actually consuming medicine. You're, you're consuming polyphenols that do incredible things for your brain health. Um, and so, and you know, again, don't be don't be afraid to tinker. Um, see how you feel. Uh, and yeah, that's it. I mean, I think that that's a pretty good, pretty good roadmap. Here's a bit of trivia. When you said embrace healthful fats, companies who have more than fifteen percent of fat in the calories of of a product are not allowed to label it healthy. And if a fat saturated, it cannot be labeled a healthy fat according mm -hmm. to current regulations. Even if there is a preponderance of evidence that it is healthy, uh, the uh, food, the people who put labels on food, people who write about food, who also sell the food, are not allowed to say that something's healthy even though it is. Yeah, it's preposterous. I mean, I feel like the, the furor around saturated fat as a heart demon has long been debunked. I mean, cholesterol recently was taken off of the USDA's nutrients of concern list, you know? And what's so, Oops. yeah. And what's, what about my egg white omelet? Oh my God, what's so mind blowing to me about that is that that happened three months ago that the USDA finally came to their senses, but it wasn't three months ago that cholesterol stopped being bad for your heart health. I mean, it's never been bad for your heart health. Unless it's highly oxidized when you eat it. Spray dried egg yolks, which they like to use in lab studies, are probably bad for you, right? Well, yeah, or if it becomes oxidized in the body, you know, which is, yeah. which is harmful, but think about how many millions of Americans have, you know, for decades been trading eggs for quick cook instant oats in the morning for their morning breakfast. So to me, this is just like infuriating. And so I think that, you know, I've really sort of decided uh, that my mission, you know, is to help sort of disseminate uh, the truth about what we're eating, you know, and how it affects our, our, our bodily health. Because, you know, once we become ill, it's, uh, it's a lot harder to, to really make a difference. It, it is indeed, and thanks for your work, and I'm really looking forward to seeing Breadhead when it comes out. Um, it, it's just so much work to make a movie, a moldy movie that just came out, like we're recording this, I think, a dozen days after it came out. Um, it was two years of really hard work. Uh, the budget was um, certainly um, a little bit higher than the amount of money you've raised. And just in order to make something that's worth watching that tells the story that can cause behavior change, like you're in for an amazing thing to do, but the satisfaction of seeing it come out and getting those messages from people who say, like people, like, like now I know, um, one of the Bulletproof employees um, has mold in his house and just didn't know it. And he wasn't involved in the documentary. When he saw the documentary, he's like, I think we have to move. Like, like, like I'm getting brain fog for the first time in my life. What's going on? Yeah. That kind of thing. Same thing's going to happen when, when you launch Breadhead. People are going to say, like, I went off gluten. I, I added fat back to my diet, and I got my brain back. And that's a, an amazing gift to do for someone. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited. You know, when you hear things like, you know, study confirms that non-celiac gluten sensitivity exists, you know, the idea that, you know, 18 million Americans are dealing with this non-gluten, you know, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and it's a vastly underdiagnosed thing. And the idea that, like, millions of Americans are consuming bread and then becoming depressed as a result of it, you know, <laughs> that are experiencing brain fog as a result of it, unwittingly, you know, thinking about their lives in a negative light because they consumed bread. To, to me, yeah. it's, it's insane, but it's also something that, like, we need to, we need to do our best to like make sure that this information spreads because to me, you know, it's a, that's a terrible thing. So where do we begin? You know, there's, there's so much work to do, but I think that like, you know, by continuing to spread this message that food is information, I think that that's how we can really make the biggest impact. 
It is indeed. Thank you, Max, for coming on Bulletproof Radio. And what we're going to do now is first, I'm going to remind you that Bulletproof Conference is coming up in October, bulletproofconference.com. We're going to talk a lot about brains this year. We're going to talk, of course, about biohacking in general, but you should go to bulletproofconference.com and check it out now, and you'll even get a better deal on your tickets because you're going to want to go. And if you were there last year, you joined 500 other people who went, it completely rocks <laughs> and it's like no other conference you've ever seen. So bulletproofconference.com and now you're going to get to see these crazy Italian appliances in the Bulletproof labs here. It's barely even set up and if you're on YouTube or you go when you get back, we're going to do a little walkthrough. I'm going to show you the new standing desk. I still use my stand desk downstairs when I'm upstairs. I have the world's most steampunk desk ever and it's badass and you're going to see it right now. Shall we get up and go check this stuff out? Yeah, let's do it. All right. This is super high tech camera work. <laughs> By the way, Max and I did not plan this. So, so th there's some things you might want to see uh, in the in the Bulletproof headquarters. One of the coolest appliances here is actually a Klingon disruptor. It's right here, and this is what it does. As a matter of fact, if you can tell me what this thing is, and you're the first person to tell me on Twitter, on at Bulletproof Exec, or on Facebook, on our Facebook page, uh, I'll send you a bag of Bulletproof coffee. So what is this thing? What could it be? Anyhow, this is one of the decorations here. And back here, is this not the coolest standing desk ever? This desk is an antique from Vancouver Island, made by the company who makes desks for the President of the United States. But of course, it's a little bit armor plated and I had to make it high enough so I could stand. So this is one of those things I like to do. This is repurposing a very old technology because this is a roll top desk, which would be completely useless, except now when you have your monitor, you want it up high. And I raised it up with metal pipe feet so that I'm comfortable when I stand, but I'm also just going to have a stool, so if I want to be sitting, I'll be at one of those standing sitting stools. And when I'm downstairs, I have the adjustable height stand desk, because I love stand desk, but I got to say, this is the coolest looking desk I've had in my life, and I'm stoked about it. And I'm working right next to the kitchen. Kitchen over here is set up so that I can show you guys what I'm doing uh, when I'm cooking. We just made coffee for Vice today. It's got that orange fridge I was talking about, which is the coolest fridge I've owned in my entire life. When I saw that, I'm like, I have to have it. And check this. If Freud had a blender, this is it. This is the manliest blender known to man. It's a commercial grade wearing blender. Uh, wearing is what some of the largest kitchens on earth do, and it's like such blender overkill, there's really no need for it, but they sent it to me because they're cool. Um, double oven convection, because when you're cooking, I'm gonna be showing you why convection matters so much, so you can actually go in and control the airflow around your food so that you're getting the right uh, crispness on the outside without burning your meat. So if you don't have a convection oven, it sucks, but there are things you can do, like even countertop convection ovens, and there's even one with steam that you'll learn how to use, because steam cooking is another thing. And of course, there's a whole coffee laboratory and things like that and I'll be using an electric stovetop here. And I recommend electric stovetops because you have such fine control on these that with this one, this is also Smeg, it'll let you melt chocolate without a double boiler. It's so finely controlled. And when I use gas, which is the way I used to do it, gas will still burn the chocolate, even on the very, very nicest range, you get it as low as you can. So real chefs prefer that, but the digital control you get with a modern electric glass top like this is superior for having temperature control in your food. So I'll talk with you guys about this over the next year or so, but I set up this space and you're really the first people to see this because you just happen to check in on the right, the right podcast. So thanks for watching. Have an awesome day. Check out bulletproofconference.com. Check out moldymovie.com. And as always, have an awesome day.